So uh, thank you very much for coming. I, I will only uh, take one minute to say well, thank you for coming in this uh, uh, crazy time. Uh, the whole world is stopped and we are in the middle of it because uh, Chris Williamson is presenting his book. <laughs> and um, uh, I just wanted to say in the name of uh, Lola Books that uh, I, for me it's a huge pleasure to be with two giants that have marked uh, my intellectual life, like uh, Ken Loach and, and Chris Williamson. Uh, for me, is probably, without a doubt, the most uh, challenging book and the most interesting book that I have ever published. It has been kind of a, a heroic publication. We are based in Berlin, and we have, pub we have published books in Spanish. And when we started, we could only use our webpage and an uh, and, uh, online shop. But uh, thanks to all the huge efforts of, uh, of Chris Williamson, now we have, uh, Lola Books has a, a distribution in, in Britain. So now we are able to, to work as a normal uh, publishing house in Britain. We will, you will be able to find the book in all the bookstores and online like any other uh, British uh, uh, publishing house. Uh, Loki, the famous uh, singer, is coming with a big pile of books in a couple of minutes, so if any of you is interested in uh, buying the book, you will be able to do so. And uh, apart from that, just uh, say that after, the, uh, after my words, uh, Ken Lodge will, will talk, and then uh, Ken, uh, Chris Williamson, and then we will have a Q&A in the case you want to, to ask any questions. Thank you very much. Ken Lodge. Okay. Um, it's only a small room, so I'm, I'm going to hopefully just, um, just speak um, without the aid of a mic. Um, the, the lights are really bright. I, I don't know if, um, if the, the skilled operator, the R, ah, could just dim it slightly. We'll just see. We can actually see each other a bit. Fantastic. Um, this is a, a very important book, and I'm very pleased to be here to support Chris Williamson. It's very important that this book is available, that it's read, and that it becomes part of the history of the labour movement. The first thing I want to say is that Chris Williamson is the victim of an injustice. That is the first point. That clearly what he wrote and what he said is not anti-Semitic, it's not open to the interpretation of being anti-Semitic, and that any, any sanction, any, any suggestion that it did is quite wrong, and it's clearly wrong. It's clearly wrong. And the suspension and expulsion, the lack of solidarity, the lack of support, is a, is a stain on the Labour Party of, the, of that time, as was the lack of support for others in that situation, beginning with Ken Livingstone, who uh, noted a uh, Jewish supporter uh, of, of the Labour Party, a man who'd been on the NEC, and as I've walked here, I tried to remember his name, and maybe some in the audience will remember his name, but he wrote about Ken Livingston, he, he should not have been expelled, and that anti-Zionism is not anti-Semitism. And I think that's the bottom line. Um, Walter Wolfgang. Well, the, world. <laughs> the, the old memory returns in, in flashes. Um, the, the, the second thing I must say is that um, due to my totally deteriorating eyesight, I haven't read all of Chris's book. I've dipped into it um, and um, read as much as I can. And, and the second point is Chris is entitled to tell his story. It's in, there has been so much abuse of Chris and people in his position, ludicrous abuse, unanswered in the mainstream media. 
people have been denied a presence on, um, in the broadcasts, denied a presence certainly in the press, and have suffered abuse really without recourse to a proper answer, except in social media, which is endless. But in the formal pages of the public discourse, Chris and others like him have, and many of us, have been effectively silenced. Now, that again justifies, demands this book be published and read. And on every bookshelf, every library where there are books on, in the labour movement, this book must be there. Um, and uh, failing memory has meant I've had to jot a few things down, so forgive me for um, this small sheet of paper. Um, I think what's important to say about the, the campaign of, of anti-Semitism, which was behind all this, these, um, these suspensions and expulsions and the, the destruction of the left, really, um, was what was said by senior Jewish members of the Labour Party right at the outset, and that's this. The campaign of anti-Semitism in the Labour Party was weaponized, and I'm quoting the words as, as exactly as I can, was weaponized to undermine the le leadership of Jeremy Corbyn in the Labour Party. And that was said right early on. And of course many Jewish members supported Chris and supported Jackie Walker and supported Mark Rogers and, and many others. Um, and that's, um, that in a way is, I think is, is, the, is the bottom line. But it's also important to say that where, and I think it's important when we would all share this, I know, that where there is credible evidence of any racism, whatever, including anti-Semitism, that where there is credible evidence, that must be um, examined and the person accused is entitled to due process. That means you question the witnesses, you can be represented, you can appeal, and there is real due process in the disciplinary procedure. That does not happen in the Labour Party. It didn't happen then, and it certainly doesn't happen now. What we, we don't have due process, we have kangaroo courts. And that's no way to, that is, that's, that allows a witch hunt to take place. Because if there's no due process, you have no, you have no recourse. I mean, I, I got kicked out for, for, um, uh, for supporting an organisation that was uh, not prescribed and I joined it. Well, I didn't join it, I supported it. Um, it was not prescribed. But um, by some um, m legal magic only known to former directors of public prosecutions, <laughs> the, that suddenly um, something you, you supported when you supported it that was legal is not now, so get out. And I mean, this is a nonsense. And of course, it's it's made um, it, it's made even clearer, or that, but that that um, unprincipled nonsense is is endorsed when the um, under Starmer, um, the the Labour Party rules now do not allow natural justice to be counted. So you can have a rule that is against natural justice. You challenge it, and natural justice, fair play, fair dealing, not allowed, not allowed. And, and this is no way for any party that wants to be seen as democratic, as humane, as responsive to human needs. You can't function like that. You really can't, and, and what a, what a, a shock that that is there. Um, so due process where there's proper allegations and, and no kangaroo courts. Um, and it did degenerate very quickly into a witch hunt. And this is the next point I want to make. The tactics, and I know Chris will talk about this at length, the tactics where you demand false confessions from people who have done nothing wrong 
to appease those who are making allegations that are not true cannot ever succeed. And the moment you think of it in those terms, in other words, you've done something wrong, but never mind, we've got to appease them because we want to hang on to the bit of power we've got. Sign this confession. I mean, where, where does that come from? What strength do we ever build? How can we ever be trusted? If good friends and comrades say, look, I, I, I know between us, we know, there's nothing, you've said nothing wrong. I know the evidence is there. I know the transcription proves you said nothing wrong. But sign this confession, because it'll get them off our backs. Well, A, we can't work like that. And B, everybody knows that if you keep running, they will keep chasing. In Mick McGahey's famous words, the Scottish miners leader during the strike. <clears throat> you keep running, they keep chasing. And of course they did. Every scout they got, they demanded six more. Every time Margaret Hodge got a victory on Newsnight, she was back again the following week. She had a season ticket, I think. <laughs> she, was there, she was there day after day, as were others. We can all name them. And that could never work. And of course it didn't work. And of course the end result is that Jeremy, and I hope to say he was very badly advised, is now himself out of the party. Why didn't we stand up in the first place? And, and I have to say in parenthesis that I count Jeremy and John as good friends over many, many years. And Chris's words are very harsh, and they, they come from his justifiable anger for being betrayed. Um, I, I wouldn't use those words personally because I say they're friends and I hope they stay friends. And, and I hope they stay, um, that as time passes, we can all agree that those tactics were wrong and that people suffered terribly because of them. And I, I know, I'm sure we all know people in the party, not high, pro high profile, but who were expelled and they give them, like Chris, give their lives to the party, rejoiced in Jeremy's victory, worked hard for it, and then found themselves accused. Many of them Jewish members. And I, the last I heard, and this is not an up-to-date figure, but a few months ago, it was said that Jewish members are now five times more likely to be expelled from Labour than non-Jewish members. Fine way to assert your... your and your attacks on anti-Semitism expel more Jewish members than anybody else. But there, there were complicated times, people were under huge pressure. And as I say, they were friends and remain friends, so I, I, some of Chris's words I, I find very harsh. But nevertheless, I understand his anger and I support his position. So it was tactics that, that, that would never work. And now we're left with a leader, Starmer, who is a shallow man, a dull man, and his only talent is to manipulate the Labour Party with support, of course, from the mass media and the BBC and independent television and the rest of them, to manipulate the party to destroy any vestige of... Um, those who supported any 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 power for those who supported Jeremy Corbyn, and to destroy the left. That's his only talent. He's dishonest in that he lied to the Labour Party. He said we will, I will nationalise um, certain. I think it was the railways. And I think I will maintain the radical policies, and I will unite the party plain lies, and he knew it, and he knew it. What a dishonourable man. And he's personally treacherous. I don't know if you remember the photograph in the 2019 election, when he put his arm round Jeremy. There's a well-known photograph, you can easily find it. His arm round Jeremy. He knew he would stab him in the back. He knew he would stab him in the back. Who 
can tolerate a leader like that in a party of the people. He is despicable. Just, just quick to to, to to finish to say something about what, what have we learned? I mean, we, lessons that we relearned really. Um, and the, the Chris has been around a long time, and I've been around the block a few times. And we, we relearn the same lessons over and over again. And what are they? Very quickly, we we learn yet again that this, we are in a society which is divided by the conflict of interest between two opposing classes that will never be reconciled. They will never be reconciled. As long as you have one class that owns and controls a market system where big corporations decide what is produced, in what conditions, on what terms people are employed, how they will destroy trade unions, they will get the cheapest labor, and you have a working class that sells its labor, needs security, job security, a home, education, health care, pensions, peace, those interests that cannot be reconciled. An irreconcilable class conflict. Second lesson, the ruling class is ruthless. They will do anything. They will lie, smear, they will go to war, they will kill. And Blair, as a member of the ruling class, how many hundreds of thousands of Iraqis did he watch endorse their killing with the Americans? Hundreds, maybe a million. <coughs> Destabilize the region. And that's just one war. They back dictators, they back, they had no problem with fascism and they support, in, yeah. supported Franco in the Spanish Civil War. That was only three years before the 1939 Second World War. Supported Franco the fascist. They will do anything. My friend Christopher Logue wrote a poem, wrote a poem some years, dead now, some years ago, called Know Thy Enemy. And it concluded with the lines, rather than lose that which he controls, he will destroy the world. And that's true. And they are destroying it now. They are ruthless. Second lesson. Third lesson. Social Democrats always betray. They always betray. Why? Because in the end, their politics are based on this. They think that the market economy, capitalism, production for private profit, can be made to serve the interests of the working class. They can be made to protect them. And so the boss has to make a profit, because that's how the system works. The boss has to make a profit before you can defend your job, or your wages, or your conditions. Because if he's not making a profit, he can't pay you. So the idea that there's an alternative system where we own the means of production, that doesn't enter the, the lexicon of the social democrats. That's why they always betray. They may be bastards, they are bastards. We know they are, individually, a lot of them. But that's not the real point. The real point is their politics are based on working with the system that exploits and goes to war. That's why they always betray. Fourth point, and we learn this, this is an interesting lesson from the Corbyn years. Sectarianism is our enemy. Sectarianism will stops us at every turn, or did do. And what was interesting, when Jeremy was leader of the Labour Party, the sectarianism faded to a large extent. Because everybody saw, wow, we have a chance here. We just, the door is pushed open. We're not there yet, but the door is just pushed ajar. And everybody got behind Jeremy and John. And the sectarianism faded away. So, Let's not go back to, let, that's the other lesson, let's not go back to those sectarian days. Fifth and final, I'll finish on this, what's a plan for the future? Well, um, Chris and I had a conversation about this yesterday and, and um, we had slightly different um, perspectives on it, but I'll offer mine up for what it's worth. And maybe not a lot, but uh, it's a thought. We desperately need a political voice, we need a political presence, because at the moment there are probably half a million people who actively supported Jeremy, Jeremy and John in the Labour Party. If they weren't members of the Labour Party, they, they supported it. They were in trade unions that supported it. Probably half a million, I would think. 
I mean, the party itself got to 600,000 from a very low number. So they're still around. Many of them have left. 100,000 left Labour last year, many more before that. So they're still around. I feel we need to keep them together. Echoing the start of the Labour Party, when the union said, we need a political voice, the unions began. And if, if, it's a huge if, if the RMT, the FBU, the CWU, parts of Unite maybe, maybe parts of Unison with Paul Holmes and others, maybe other smaller unions, if they could get together and be found an independent labor movement that with a program that was based on the 2017, 2019 manifestos, because that, that brought us together. Not perfect, but it brought us together. It's a start. It's the beginning of a transformative program. Public ownership, human rights, council housing, you know, the, the, the basic, the pillars of those manifestos. Put some money into a, an infrastructure with researchers, with a a, a, a proper movement, a, a proper organisation, and we could find spokespeople on those main issues, based on the on the, the manifestos. So, all the labour lot stood on it twice. Start with that, with speakers who really believed in it and could argue well. And we have no end of talent, no shortage of talent, academics, um, trade unionists young people, young ones coming up. I mean, brilliant. We have a brilliant array of talent. We could knock Starmer out of the ground, really. And then you have a political... If with that behind them, and as the unions are now on a crest of, of industrial action, which is popular, now is the moment. When Starmer says, if you join the picket line, you're out, that is the moment when he says, right, there's the challenge. And if the left doesn't pick that up, well, we don't deserve the name of wanting fundamental change. Because that is the challenge. Because if a union can't organize a strike through a picket line, you can't, you can't organize a strike. And withdrawing your labor is the only weapon in the end the working class has. The only weapon that hurts. Now, when he says don't join a picket line, that's the moment at which those un unions who count themselves radical has to say, right, we no longer have a party of Labour. We will have a Labour movement so that those who choose to stay in the Labour Party can be in it for the moment. You know, trade unions can, can affiliate, be in a trade union, don't have to be an individual member. Whatever. Build it, and then there'll be a point at which you say, right, it's not enough that we just say it, now we have to have a political presence, and we have to make the structural changes, we have to bring in the laws to make that happen. It's a long shot. But I think it's the best hope we've got. Anyway, look, I support Chris. I'm, I'm so glad his book is out. Some of the words are a bit harsh, but some of them are harsh. <laughs> so, but I understand why you write them. So good luck, and please, everybody read it. Let me start by thanking Ken Loach from the bottom of my heart. It's an incredible privilege, actually, to be sharing the platform with a legend, a legend of the cinema world, a legend of the Labour movement. I mean, as a kid, I remember watching programmes like Cathy Come Home, um, Kez, you know, that, that seminal work that Ken did, and then obviously all the stuff that he's done right the way through you know, to my dad and Blake. And, and other works he's done about the Spanish Civil War and the rest. I remember my partner, my late wife, coming out of uh, the cinema after watching that film in tears. You know, he really, really moved at Ken. And so, you know, more power to you. I know you're working on a, a new film now. So, so keep going, Ken. Uh, and thank you for your support for this book. It re really is important because Ken stood up. You know, a lot of people ran away. All of the campaign group ran away. Campaign group of Labour MPs. Well, the socialist campaign <laughs> of Labour MPs just kept their heads down. I had no public support from a solitary soul. And I go into some detail about this in the book. And only, we well, could count on the fingers of one hand the number 
that actually contacted me privately, and only two of those contacted me on a regular basis. That was mainly Laura Smith, who was incredibly supportive, and uh, Richard Bergen. Uh, Laura, I remember saying to me, and I put this in the book, and uh, part of the language, which she said, I feel like a bag of shit, Chris, for not publicly supporting you, but I'm too scared to do it on my own. And I'm bringing it up every week at the weekly meeting of the Socialist Campaign Group of Labour MPs, and they're just stonewalling, and they're not prepared to, to actually offer that support. But you'll read about that if, if you um, decide to get a copy of the book and uh, go into that in, in some detail. I also want to thank uh, Carlos, because I had a hell's end job, you know, trying to get a, a publisher. Uh, it was uh, very difficult, well, impossible in fact. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm not saying I, I approached every publisher in, in the country, but I approached the usual suspects, including the left wing ones, or the ones, you know, Pluto, Verso, etc. Nobody would touch it. I even asked Carlos if he knew any British publishers that uh, would be willing to, to take it. And he recommended a few, actually, and was quite optimistic that they would take it on, and they wouldn't. And in the end, Carlos said, well, I'll publish it for you. I'm not based in Germany, but I'll do it. And so thank you so much, Carlos, for, for taking it on, because, you know, <laughs> you know the reason why people are fearful uh, of, of, of publishing it, and of supporting people like me and others who've spoken out, is because they fear the reprisals. They fear what might happen to them in terms of their career, their livelihoods. You know, from the Zionist lobby, let's be let's be upfront about it. Ken Loach himself has been a victim of this many years ago now. You know, he's, the work that he did, you know, petition. Um, a very powerful lobby, uh, and to actually challenge them, it, you know, is, is, can be seen as career suicide. So, and there was a few funny things happening, wasn't there, Carlos? In terms of you know, your business, etc. Without, look, we won't go into the detail just in case. But anyway, uh, we were a bit worried that you know that. Uh, and, I mean, Carlos didn't say this, but you know, I was I was a bit concerned actually that, that you know that Carlos's you know business was was potentially jeopardised. But hopefully we've got through that. And, you know, things will think move on. So thank you, Carlos, for that. I also want to thank um, a number of people who have written really kind um, uh, reviews. Uh, Tony Greenstein is a prolific blogger, Jewish guy. One of the people who I defended, supported, um, was attacked for doing so. Bear in mind, of course, Jew uh, uh, Tony is Jewish. The son of a rabbi, the son of a rabbi, actually, not just any old rabbi, but a rabbi who took on Oswald Moses fascist at the Battle of Cable Street, and he was the first Jewish member of the party to be accused of anti Semitism and kicked out unceremoniously from the Labour Party. And, you know, and Tony is a, a prolific uh, blogger, and I'm, you know, he was one of the first out of the blogs to write a very kind and supportive uh, review of my book. Jason Cridland also from Dorset Eye. Which a very kind review. If you've not seen it, I recommend uh, well, both Tony's and obviously Jason's. And, and of course, John Booth. Um, he used to work for the Labour Party, actually. He used to work for Labour Weekly, but got turfed out by the midwife to New Labour, Neil Kinnock. And, and he's written a very kind uh, review, too. And uh, that will be appearing in the Lobster magazine, um, an important, influential magazine, actually. Um, so if you get a chance to not to read that, but just read The Lobster in, in general and read John Booth's work. It's very, very good. And of course, Ben Chaco from The Morning Star also wrote a, a review, so I'm, I'm, I'm grateful uh, to that. But this story is a story that, you know, the right wing and the, much of the left actually don't want to be told because the left didn't cover themselves in glory. And here's Loki with the book, so uh, give Loki a welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Because the, you know, the left, did, I mean, you know, we've gone into that. Um, I think Ken's touched on it, I've mentioned it in terms of the Socialist uh, Campering Group of Labour MPs, but it wasn't just them, I mean, it was large sections of momentum. The optics left, as I call them, people like Owen Jones, people like the bar and media. Um, uh, yeah, these are people who were incredibly, I thought, support, well, they were in fact supportive uh, of me. I remember uh, uh, one of the, uh, Key figures at the Bar Media, for example, introducing me at the Trafalgar Square uh, demonstration against Donald Trump, saying, I am so pleased, ladies and gentlemen, to welcome the bad man of Derby North. Will you please give it up for Chris Williams? So make some noise! And she's crying, and then the next.
next couple of three months later, she's calling for me to be suspended from the <laughs> Labour Party. You know, I mean, these people just sort of blow with the wind because they're keen to try and, uh, you know, manufacture a career in the in the corporate uh, media. And so I think, you know, the left, much of the left, you know, let themselves down. They let this movement down. They let the country down. Actually, they let all the millions of people who are now struggling with a cost of living catastrophe because they didn't support Jeremy Corbyn sufficiently, they didn't actually, you know, get behind this campaign, they joined in the ludicrous smears about anti-Semitism and this ridiculous refrain from the men about, was it uh, walking and chewing gum or something, a ridiculous proposition, we're saying, oh, well, you know, you can be, you know, support Israel, etc., and, uh, and still call out anti-Semitism. I mean, they were seeing anti-Semites around every corner, it was absurd. I mean, and as Tony Greenstein has put it, um, in reality, Jewish people are really a victim of racism in this country anymore. He says, I thought I'm Jewish. He says, I've never been stopped driving while Jewish, you know, or stopped to serve <laughs> because I'm Jewish. It just doesn't happen in reality. That's not to say there isn't any anti Semitism. Of course, there is. But it is from the right, not from the left. And indeed, you know, the cases which were identified, again, again, to touch on this in, in the book, were from far-right extremists. And yet, when we were being lectured about this by the corporate media, and indeed by people on the left, prominent figures, you know, they, they sort of somehow conveniently forgot that bit, and left out that bit, and gave the impression that people like Luciana Berger and uh, Ruth Smith and the rest of it were being attacked by Labour Party members. It was just, just an invention, this wasn't true. At all, but of course, it's important to remember this was never about anti-Semitism anyway. You're sure that uh, Aloni, former uh, 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 senior minister in Israel, said that anti-Semitism is a trick that we always use. This was never about anti-Semitism. It was a, a convenient stick with which to beat the left, to destroy what was a, a socialist, very modest socialist domestic program. But the thing that really frightened the horses was the anti-imperialist agenda. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, Ken said I've used some harsh words, and that's true, I have. But I've also been incredibly generous, I think, as well, about, about Jeremy in particular. Oh, I love Jeremy. You know, when Jeremy became the leader, God, he got me out of, as I put in the book, a slav of, of, of despond. I was distraught when I lost my seat. You know, I'd given my life to the Labour Party, and it was, uh, it was an incredible blow. We never expected to lose the seat. We were being predicted by uh, the Ashcroft poll, for example, suggested that we were going to win Derby North by over 9,000. So it was a massive shock. And then there was talk about Jeremy putting his hat in the ring, and then would he get the nominations? And then he got onto the ballot. And I, you know, that gave me a new lease of life and toured the country supporting Jeremy. And, and Jeremy rehabilitated socialism, uh, put in place, which is what I was just about to go on and say, about you know, a, a minister for peace and disarmament. Amazing uh, idea and uh, incredibly inspirational. And, Something which really angered, of course, the establishment, the military-industrial complex, but I thought, well, how beautiful that would be. What an elegant proposition to have a permanent member of the UN Security Council. Instead of spreading war and arms sales around the world, to be spreading peace and disarmament. I mean, that would have been an amazing um, force for good in the world. And, you know, as I say, I, you know, I, I talk about that in the, in the book. I don't want to go too long because Ken has, um, has got to leave at, at, at 8 o'clock, but I want to give an opportunity for maybe some contributions from the floor. But the book, of course, doesn't have to be talking 10 years hard later. So it's not just about the Corbyn project and you know, the failure of that. It, it covers, obviously, the, the Miliband era as well. It's basically covered the period from when I first got elected to Parliament. And I supported Ed Miliband and a bit attacked by the likes of Owen Jones. Well, he never supported I know, I know, but, you know, he's, he's really a kind of, you know, Blairite who's, who's kind of uh, uh, sort of uh, rediscovered himself, you know, he's a kind of wolf in sheep's clothing. It's not a nonsense, but um, the reason I backed Ed Miliband was that he was the only person, in my opinion, that was capable of defeating the continuity New Labour candidate, which was his brother, uh, obviously, David. And he did talk about, let's remember, he did talk about turning the page on New Labour. That's what he said. He also said, if we'd listened to our members a bit more, we wouldn't have made as many mistakes. And I remember going on the Democracy Road Show and, you know, reciting uh, the words of Ed Miliband and pointing out that, yes, indeed, had we listened to our members, we wouldn't have gone to war in Iraq. We wouldn't have cut benefits for the poorest people in society. We wouldn't have introduced 
tuition fees, you know, we would have had an industrial strategy that was, uh, you know, worth its uh, salt in that sense. We would have stopped the offshoring of good quality uh, jobs to uh, low-wage economies around the world. And so I supported Ed, but he was another huge disappointment. I remember saying to Ed, and again I mentioned this in the book, where he, he was in, uh, in deep conversation with uh, Luciana Berger and, um, and uh, Chuck Ramuni, and uh, this was after he'd, he'd addressed the hostings of the old piece before he became the leader. And he was very good. I remember going up to Ed and saying, keep that passion, Ed, and be yourself. He said, oh, well, thanks, folks, you know. But he clearly wasn't interested in my counsel. He was wanted to, he was, was hanging on every word from Luciana and from, from Shuka. And it was just an incredible disappointment. He, did, he, he was, unfortunately, continuity of new labour. And we paid the price for that. You know, um, myself and Michael Meacher got together just before the general election in 2015, well, the end of 2014, actually. Uh, oh, was I not working before? I was only up for no reason. Um, <laughs> and um, we decided that the direction of travel was a disaster for the party. You know, we'd, we'd had the referendum in Scotland, and so we felt we needed to put something out there to try and put some pressure on the leadership to put forward an alternative proposition. We didn't want to write, you know, we didn't want to be, you know, write an alternative manifesto. We, we just wanted to try and be helpful. So we got a few people together, those five of us came together, and we, we said, okay, well, what should, what should we focus on? We focused on three areas. One was saying we should reject austerity. We should demand the full renationalization of the, uh, proper renationalization of the, of the road. It was not this halfway house at Billy Bank, okay, well, we're going to set up a special purpose vehicle to bid for the franchises against the, the private sector movie trust, and to repeal all of the anti-trade union legislation. We managed to get 15 MPs to sign that statement, including obviously Jeremy, John McDonald, people like Diane Abbott and so on. Um, but what was interesting was, Labour List then did a survey and it had overwhelming support of reference members. And more significant than that, polls suggested that it had overwhelming support of the public. A bit like Jeremy's but latterly, when, if you remember, Charles Brown was going around looking, looking for secret socialists in Guildford and finding everybody supporting the renationalisation of the railways, kicking the privateers out of the NHS, scrapping tuition fees, regulating the private rental sector. There was overwhelming support for the programme and there was support for what we were putting forward. And, you know, it, it, just, it just didn't happen. But I go into some detail about the failure of the Millibank years how Liam Byrne came to the Parliamentary Labour Party telling us how that we had to support the welfare, well, not support, but not oppose the welfare reform bill. Appalling, you know, that we shouldn't uh, oppose the benefit cap. And I remember making an impassioned speech at the Parliamentary Labour Party saying, look, we shouldn't be, as a Labour Party, penalising the victims of a Tory policy failure if we're serious about welfare reform, what well, we should be on, and I also point out, it's our failure as well, let's remember, because we were in government for 13 years and we didn't put the law, actually, to do anything about the deregulated private rental sector, and we didn't build hardly any council houses either. I was saying, if we want to do something about welfare reform, let's demand rent regulation again. Let's put a cap on the amount that landlords can charge for their properties. Let's demand a council house building programme again. That's what we should be doing, you know? And so we we'll talk about that. I we'll talk about how the retrospective uh, legislation that, that uh, was, was put in place and how, again, Byrne told us that we had to uh, abstain on that as well. This was retrospective legislation relating to unemployed workers who were being forced to do unpaid work, if you remember, in a place like Poundland. And one of the people who was a victim of that, she took a case, it was globally known as the Poundland case, and she won that case. And then the government was introducing retrospective legislation to stop paying out backdated benefit to some of the poorest people in the country. And then Labour would be told, oh, we can't oppose this, you know. So I go into all of that, um, and then go on to well, explain, I think, why that's why we ended up losing the 2015 election. All the hope that was invested in, in Jeremy Corbyn, and also explain, I think, that, you know, where we went wrong was that we, I mean, Ken's touched on this, but we just didn't fight back. And I think a decision was taken by Jeremy and by the people around him, but your rich kids, it seems to me, that were advising Jeremy in the leader's office. Um, they didn't know there was something to be other in reality, you know, if, if we're honest about it. Um, and, and they took a decision, and John as well, John McDonald, that 
And what we needed to do was to keep the party together. We didn't want to lose, you know, we had to try and placate the parliamentary Labour Party. But whilst we, and of course, let's remember the Zionist lobby as well, because they were determined to destroy Jeremy Corbyn. And there was no compromising with these people, no matter how many times we apologised to him. I said to Jeremy, I said to the socialist campaign group, and again, I go into some detail in the book about this, for Christ's sake, Jeremy, stop saying sorry. You of all people have nothing to apologise for. Your record on fighting racism is unimpeachable. When these Tories, let's remember people like uh, Norman Tevitt turning up to that demonstration on Parliament Square organised by the Board of Deputies, as Tony Greenstein points out, the first demonstration against racism that the Board of Deputies have, have ever organised against a party which was an anti-racist party, but that's by the by. But Norman Tevitt, he of the cricket test, turned up uh, to that, uh, uh, that uh, demonstration. But I said to him, look, Jeremy, you, of all people, have got nothing to apologise for. When these Tories were wearing badges saying, hang Mandela, you were being arrested on the, on the doorstep of the South African embassy opposing apartheid. And I also said, and I made this point to the Socialist Campaign Group as well, look, every apology, every concession that you make is just feeding the beast and making it stronger. You cannot satisfy the appetite of this, you know, these bad faith actors. You can't stand up to them. And while you're not standing up, and while we weren't standing up, what was happening was that Jeremy's Praetorian Guard had just been systematically thrown under the bus. Tony Greenson, that I mentioned, Ken Livingston. In my opinion, Ken has done more of, as a person, a high-profile Labour politician in public office, to advance the cause of anti-racism than anybody else. I mean, that's my opinion, but I genuinely believe that when he was leader of the GLC and obviously mayor of London, but particularly as the GLC, he earned the super case of the lefty partly because of his stance on anti-racism. <coughs> he was thrown under the bus. Jackie Walker was thrown under the bus. Black Jewish woman whose parents were hounded out of the United States under the uh, McCarthy like witch hunt, you know? Cyril Chilson and his partner. Cyril's parents survived Auschwitz, for Christ's sake. And he was accused of anti-Semitism because he was a Corbyn supporter, a pro-Palestinian. Nothing about anti-Semitism. It was just, a, you know, as Sean uh, Maloney pointed out, it was a trick, and it was facilitated by the constant apologising and, and, and by the optics left, the likes of Owen Jones and the rest of it, the newspapers like the Guardian and, and so on and so forth. And so I explain all this without kind of giving you, you know, all the kind of <laughs> information in the book, as it were, and go into a lot of detail about that. But it's not just, I hope, anyway when people read it, just a, a depressing account of a failure, and it was a failure, let's be honest about it, and it was a massive setback for us. We climbed to the top of the mountain, we glimpsed the promised land, didn't we? And then we were dragged back down unceremoniously. That's why it feels, you know, it's not, it wasn't just a defeat, it just feels even worse, because we were within touching distance of transforming this country. We were in touching distance of doing it. We knew that the odds were massively against us, when Jeremy was elected, if you remember as leader for the scene, a serving army general said, we will use fair means or foul to stop a Corbyn-led Labour government cutting defence spending, withdrawing from NATO or scrapping Trident. Fair means or foul against a democratically elected government. That's treason. That's treason. And yet he was reported and said he was fine. You know, oh yes, yeah, serving army general, you know. So we knew we were up against massive odds. But the members were up for it. As I went around the country on the Democracy Roadshow, I made the point, look, we're going to need a mobilised movement on the street, potentially, to defend this Labour government. Because the odds are massively against us. The establishment will not, they will do whatever they can. I used to quote that, that general who was reported in the Times and other media outlets. There was massive support there, you know, for it. We might not have got there, let's be honest about it, because the odds were, but we ended up not trying. We certainly didn't try hard enough. I think we gave up, frankly. And what hurts me is that we kept saying it, a few of us, to the Socialist Campaign Group, to Jeremy directly, but we were just ignored. That's what I feel so hurt by. But it's not just a tale of woe is me and is thing all terrible, because I am the boy. And it, you know, Ken has made this point as well. I don't think there's that much difference between Ken and I. About the importance of sticking together about the importance of solidarity, about not resorting back to those kind of sectarian 
groupings which has afflicted the, the movement forever, and let's not underestimate the role of the state in fermenting that as well. I think where we differ is, and uh, people may know that I have to establish the resist movement, it's a small acorn at the moment, but our members have voted overwhelmingly to create a political party. I think people think, see politics through the prism of, of, ele of elections, but if you haven't got a movement to underpin that, then, you know, you're always going to be disappointed, I think, by elected representatives, because you need a mobilised, politicised movement to hold their feet to, for keep, to hold their feet to the party, you know, to keep elected members rooted in reality. And that's why I think, you know, open selections was what I was arguing for, why the, you know, the MPs were, were so unhappy about you know, what I was saying. Um, you know, it was so crucial, really. I mean, it wasn't, you know, necessarily, I mean, there's a lot I wanted to get rid of, but I just think, having that requirement to go through an endorsement process of your members actually will, would, keep, would have kept MPs rooted, would have, and because look, members are in the constituency 24-7, and, uh, you know, um, I just think it would make you know, better representatives. I used to say, look, if MPs want a job, because being an MP is not a job or a career, when you start treating it as such, you start making decisions based on that. If you want a job, go get a job in a building site, like I used to do, or in the city, or in a shop, or in the, wherever, you know. Being an MP is a privilege, and you're there to represent the constituents that elected you, of course, and the, you know, the political party, and the ideology of that, of that party, etc. So I end the book, really, by talking about the importance of, of coming together, collaborating, working together, and what we've as I say, voted in the resist to do is to register the political party. And we're in discussions now with the Socialist Labour Party. Because lots of people have been saying, what we need is a Socialist Labour Party. Not necessarily realising that the Socialist Labour Party was founded some years ago, actually. Uh, that, you know, when Blair got rid of uh, Clause 4 of the Labour Party Constitution. And it's an unambiguously anti-capitalist party. Now, it's been worrying one for a few years, let's be honest about it. But I think it has huge potential to be rejuvenated. It has a great tradition, a great history, I believe. And I think the zeitgeist is in the right place now. And I think it could, it could cut through. But on its own, that wouldn't be enough. Because Ken's absolutely right. Of course we need the trade unions on board. Of course we need a social movement. It's absolutely crucial. Without that, you're nothing. That's how in Bolivia, because they've got the movement towards socialism, which is based in the community, which is based in civil society and the trade union movement, they were able to defeat a US-backed coup in less than 12 months to overturn it, force new elections, and come back the socialists with an even bigger majority than Evo Morales achieved, you know, less than 12 months previous. That's the model, I think, that we should be aiming for. That's what I talk about at the end of the book. So yes, I think, in my opinion, I hope, modestly, it is a cautionary tale. A salutary lesson on, you know, how not to conduct yourself. And I, and like Ken said, those people that were inspired by Jeremy haven't gone away. They haven't disappeared into the ether. And I think our job is to try and somehow bring uh, people together. And we've got Clive Hemscott here from, from the Trade Union and the Socialist Coalition who've been doing some great work. It was established by Bob Crow all those years ago. We, we've got to find ways of, of collaborating, and collaborating and working together, it seems to me. And I think if we do that, then, you know, we can still prevail. And we'll have had the benefit, of course, now, we'll have had the benefit of the light of experience of how not to do it with, with what happened, you know, in the Corbyn project. So let's look forward with optimism, comrades, and hopefully this will be a, a useful text to uh, uh, steer us uh, along the right path and, and hopefully avoid us making the same mistakes that we made uh, in the years that, that Jeremy was leading the party. Thanks. <laughs> Yeah, okay, yeah, Ken's got the shoe off. Yeah. So, so I've got to train the catch face, but really nice to see him. Yeah. It makes sure everybody buys the book. Great, thanks, Ken. Okay. Oh, uh, Jack? So, uh, well, two great speeches from two giants and, and uh, 
if you would like to, to make any questions to Chris. Oh, thank you. Well, I would love to catch you as well. But, um, Chris, thank you. That was great. I've got my copy of the book. I'm really looking forward to reading it. Um, in terms of kind of moving forward, I am one of those people that Jeremy Corbyn kind of opened the door for, and I've been, I looked through and I like what I saw, and I've been, you know, every day is a school day for me, so I come to events like this partly to learn, but I'd also like to express my solidarity with you. And I just wondered, in terms of moving forward, what what do you think about the Enough is Enough campaign? Um, I mean, it, it, it feels to me a bit as though it tallies with some of the things that, that, that Ken has been saying. Uh, in my corner of London, uh, Enfield, we're, we're investing hope in it. We're trying to kind of start a, 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 a group, a kind of community socialist kind of uh, enough is enough group. We're about to, to try and organise a launch meeting. I just wondered if there's any, even if it's an expression of solidarity that I could take to the meeting from you. But, I'll, but, but I'll, any advice for, for us? I mean, what are your thoughts? Obviously, if you think it's a terrible idea, don't no, say I don't, I don't think it's, No, I don't think it's <laughs> No, I don't think it's a terrible idea at all. I think it's really important, a very useful uh, addition. I think it's inspired a lot of people. People are desperate, they're looking for something, aren't they now? Uh, I understand it's got something like a half a million supporters, so, you know, a lot of them, I think, will be the people that are inspired by, by Jeremy and so on. And so in terms of that role as being a, you know, a social movement, and bringing pressure, etc., absolutely crucial. But, and this is where I think, you know, Ken and I may be slightly different, is enough is enough, absolutely. But what happens at the ballot box? What are we going to say? Are we going to tell people, oh, is enough enough? We're going to say, well, whether they're going to just vote Labour. Labour, I mean, you know, it kind of still grieves me to say this because I was defined by the Labour Party. You know, there's a little vignette in, in the book where I talk about, you know, first joining the Labour Party and, uh, and going along to the local, we um, used to collect the tote for the Labour Party. And uh, the kids used to, well, there was a little council estate at the edge of our village and they used to go around knocking and collect the, the tote, weekly tote, you know. Uh, and the kids, if they'd be out playing the chat, well, Dad, the Labour man's here. And I just thought, you know, when, that, you know, when I was kicked out, you know, I thought, God, you know, the Labour man is no more type of thing. But So it was quite a hard thing to, 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 to accept, as it were. But the point is, if we are saying, or if enough enough goes on to say, well, they're not obviously making these uh, recommendations at the moment, but ultimately we do need to come to a view, well, what are we going to do at the election? when it comes. Bear in mind, obviously, that politics ain't just about elections. I mean, you know, in many ways, it's, you know, the more important thing is the, is the, is the, is the social movement. And if we get a mobilised social because everything we've ever achieved in this country has only been done through direct action, through, through social movement, through the trade union movement. So it's never been given. It's been, we've had to drag it from the establishment, keeping and screaming. But you've got a Labour Party now, which is the flip side of the Tory party. In a way, it always has been. And again, I touch on this in the book. I to quote yeah. Philip Snowden from back in 1924, the first Labour Chancellor of the Exchequer, saying how they must, you know, we must ignore the wild men of the party, you know, the left wingers, etc. I'm paraphrasing what he's saying. You know, the, the exact quote is in is in the book. And basically, what he was he was rejecting was the notion this was a minority government in 1924 that they should put through, as the left were arguing for in the Labour Party, a a socialist program, knowing full well that it would get voted down, and then they could go to the country and um, say, well, this is what we'd like to do, they'll vote for us. But he said, no, we're not going to do that. Essentially, what the Labour Party wanted to do then, what they wanted to do right the way through, is to make themselves acceptable to the ruling elites, to the establishment, it seems to me. So that's the question I think I'll be putting to enough is enough, is great, let's build this movement, let's put pressure, let's engage in direct action, let's build the the uh, uh, industrial disputes and the support for them. But when the general election comes, are we going to say we're Labour? Are we going to say we're Liberal Democrat? Uh, what are we going to do? And we need an alternative voice. Now, great, look, I mean, as Ken has said, if the unions will say, well, you know, we'll create this, or I'd like to think that they will kind of join in with, bearing in mind where the Socialist Labour came, Socialist Labour Party came from the trade union movement, the aftermath of the minor strike and all that kind of stuff, Arthur Scargill and so on. People are bought probably part of the SLP as well, but then it'd be great if they want. But if they want to set up a separate vehicle, great. Uh, but that's the question, I think. It's all good what's being done at the minute, but it's that 
$64,000 question, what do you do when the elections come around? What's the advice going to be? Because if it's Labour, it's just continuity neoliberalism. It's just continuity imperialism. It's just continuity war. You know? So that's, that's essentially what I would be pressing supporters of Enough is Enough to actually start asking these difficult questions at meetings. We have another question? Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, thank you, Chris, and um, um, thank you, Ken. And, um, it was an amazing event, and I'm really glad to be here. And um, yeah, um, I highly recommend that, um, that people read um, Chris's book because um, Chris's case is really important, as Ken said, as it's, there's many lessons that we can learn from it because it's, uh, there's, um, it highlights many of the contradictions at the heart of the British left and the British Labour movement because. <coughs> Again, like, um, if, I know Jeremy Corbyn's a bit, so if it wasn't for him, I'd be on watching the telly at the moment. Mm -hmm. You know, at the same time, we have the contradiction. Chris is probably, after Jeremy, the most high profile victim of the witch hunt. And we say, but Chris was essentially counted out of his job, counted out of the end of the party for defending Palestine and for defending Jeremy Corbyn. And the really the terrible thing is this happened under the leadership of Jeremy. And that's the massive contradiction we have there. But again, this is. You know, which um, people have written about, and Marx wrote about this, Lenin wrote about this, about the kind of the difference in, between actions and indeed words and deeds of the British left. And, um, you know, so it's really hard because, again, anything future coming forward, things are likely to get in Jericho's political to tend to figure, and things will coalesce around him. So the question is uh, how to stop this happening again. Because at the moment we're seeing um, that's been quite surprising in some ways to see the number of people in this country who. They call themselves socialists, but at the same time, quite happy to be you can be a royalist at the same time. And it's like, what the hell is going on? You know, but so how many of us are there? So it's good to see this many people. You know, but oh, so that's a massive, massive question that we'll have to keep asking for a long time. But on the positive sides, as Ken mentions, as Ken mentioned talking about, as Chris mentions in the book, you know, it's the the number of people that did come together as a result, who were inspired by the point by Corbyn. And one of the things is like, it's given us a glimpse of something that we've seen and we can't unsee it. You know, just one final thing. Again, I, again so I joined some um, Labour Party in 2015 as one of the three pound members to vote for Jeremy, and tend to be an armchair supporter, and one of the to the other. So, after the 2017 election, we had a shock result during the well, we have the election campaign itself with the various incidents that, and the attempts to stop the campaign, including from inside the Labour Party and to stop the election, the surprise results, and the Tories have completely shaken already. And then a week later, a week or two later again, the country was shocked again by the awful like, Grenfell tragedy, and yeah. which kind of it was like a moment that exposed like, like, yeah, the way the state of the country and the people, the kind of the monsters that were running it, and um, the point of Oakley was over there as well. It's just like, I believe it's an inspiration to people, and it continues to be. And, yeah. um, <laughs> so, um, so, 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 at that time, we were waiting again. The court movement have assembled this kind of movement of tens and tens of thousands of us, and waiting for kind of some direction from the unions, from the Labour Party, and there was nothing. And, um, it's tied to what you said about people being afraid to take power. And I knew some of my friends that were saying, well, Corbyn had got up to it and he's actually bottled it, you know? And, um, you know, so my question is the one, it's like, again, how can you see this this again? Well, I think learning the lessons, I mean, and hopefully the book that I've written will, will help us to, to do that, see what happened and where we went wrong. And, and I think recognising the importance of this of this social movement that I talked about, uh, and the need for an alternative political vehicle. That's why I think you know the enough the enough movement is a great initiative. But I think we need to be asking those questions. I mean, some of my you know, the leadership of that might find it a bit difficult, but they've got to consider this because you know when there's an election in two years, uh, and we've got to have to decide what we're going to do. You know, and I think we need a new political vehicle. Uh, I, I think potentially the Socialist Labour Party could be it. Could be. But there might be something else. I'm not going to necessarily you know, worry to that. If it is, great. And we want to try and make it work. You know, it might be the trade union and the socialist coalition. I mean, you know, they've been around a while now since 2010. Um, 
I mean, the trade union was quite popular now, didn't it? So it's, it's, they, they, they both said it was a bit of an awkward, you know, like long-winded, uh, not very kind of user-friendly name. But on the other hand, trade unionists on the ballot paper might actually might actually go down uh, quite well. So I think that's what we need to be doing: getting involved in movements like in office, obviously getting involved in our in our uh, trade unions, um, and I think as well encouraging grassroots trade unionism because often the trade union bureaucrats have been the problem as much as you know the Labour Party leadership and the wider establishment. Down through history, you know, you look back to the general stock in 1926 at Bloody TUC, let us down, sold us out, you know. Uh, when the Lucas uh, workers devised the Lucas plan when there were cuts in defence spending and 13 unions came together under the leadership of uh, Mike Cooley, I think it was Covina, 13 trade unions were brought together with the shop stewards combine and I met some of the, uh, I had the privilege of meeting some of the uh, original uh, shop stewards uh, committee uh, a few years ago and they said they did all that in the teeth of the opposition of the trade union bureaucracy so the bureaucracy of the trade unions can sometimes be you know they're not all Arthur Scargills or uh, you know Eddie Dempsey's etc so I think getting involved there I think is really important and one just the final thing about uh, about Grenfell I was shortly after the appalling tragedy of Grenfell was made the shadow fire minister and the people in the local community were really unhappy about the appointment of Sir Martin Warwick as the chair of the inquiry. And so I made it my business to support their calls and said that he should not be in that position because this community has been you know, shut on, if we're honest, you know, um, forever. And, you know, is this just going to be another whitewash? And whoever chaired, my view was, and I'll make this publicly known, you know, the media, whoever chaired that committee has to have the confidence of the community that was affected by this tragedy. And uh, then uh, Shami Chakrabarty called an emergency meeting, and Richard Burke was there, and Diane Apple was there, and I was told, and I was said to talk, we can't do that, we can't speak, and things like that, you know. Uh, Smart and Warwick's a nice guy, um, and we, you know, we, we have to uh, just accept that, I mean, and Shani was the Shadow Attorney General and Diane was the Shadow Secretary and Richard was the Shadow Justice Minister and I was just a lowly um, junior Shadow Minister for Fire and the Rescue Services. So I had to kind of, you know, just swallow that really and uh, I was due to appear on uh, what's his name? Nick Ferrari's show the next morning. I knew he was going to ask me the question. Um, do I still think that more me? should not be the chair or should be sacked. But I was able to, as I'm saying in the book, bludgeon my way through the interview by pointing out that the minister has made it clear that whatever I say, or anybody says, Morlick is going to be the chair of the inquiry. Uh, and so we now need to look at how we can make sure that this inquiry is fit for purpose, get all the people that are part of the team and so on and so forth. But as I say in the book, I should never be put in that position. Because we were talking about a new kind of politics. Were we? This is very early on, this, just after the 2017 election. What in God's name were we doing? <coughs> Not supporting the people. We were supporting the establishment again against the people. And it was some of the left wingers, in inverted commas, who were telling me we couldn't do it. You know, that left a very sort of bitter taste in the mouth, I've got to say. Um, and I think that's another mistake that we must not make in the future. Because, you know, if we're a people's party, we should stand up for the bloody people. That's what we should be about. You know, not trying to placate the establishment, not trying to placate the judiciary, you know, and being told he's a nice man, he's a shy man. I'm not interested in that. The people in Grenfell, if he's so badly wronged, didn't want him. And we knew because he was an establishment figure. We knew by some of the cases that he ruled upon that he was an establishment figure. His cases that he ruled upon against people had been overturned by the Supreme Court. And yet we had to accept it. That, that was, you know, very disappointing. Sorry, I went oh, on yeah, sorry. <laughs> Mr. King? Chris, I think what you've done, and I haven't read your book, I'm sure, with all the discussions that you and I have had over the past two or three years, it is going to be an extremely good book. But, and here's my big but, I think when we read your book, we also have to read Ralph Miliband's book. Very much so that he wrote some years and years ago yep. telling us all on the left that a parliamentary democracy will never get through to us on the left achieving what we want to achieve. 
there is no question that what you've been through and what some of us have been through will never ever get past parliamentary so-called democracy. We need something else. We need for us all to get out on the streets and do our own thing and not produce another party to go through what you've been through, what Jeremy Corbyn through. We've got to get out and fight and take control ourselves. Uh, and if you look at a number of other uh, countries that are doing that now, it can be successful. That's what we should be doing. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you in terms of, of that. I'm not quite as pessimistic about because I do think there is still a role for uh, you know, uh, elected officials, but that needs to, that needs to be underpinned by that uh, by that social movement. I quote actually Ralph Miliband in, in the in the book when you read it. So so you'll you'll see that I'm certainly on board there with what. Interesting, Ralph Miliband did slightly change his position from from the time that he wrote that book when Tony Benn was in his was in his pot. But of course, as we saw when Tony Benn was seeking the deputy leadership in 1981, of which I was part of that campaign as well. Again, you know, we got very, very close, we got undone by the right-wing establishment inside the, the Labour uh, uh, Party. Um, so yeah, so, so Ralph does make some really important uh, points, and, and if we rely on the, the parliamentary road to socialism, you know, you know, you're not hide at all, it's just not going to happen. You need that on-street movement, absolutely, you need the trade union movement, but, but coming back to this thing about enough is, unless we have a revolution, come on, games, um, you, you know, is that, okay, we do that, we put all that pressure, but then when the election comes, what are we going to do? Are we just going to, what, are we going to boycott them? And we might not be a tactic, I don't know, but um, well, that, we do need to, I think, still address that, short of a revolution, but getting people on the street, I'm telling you, you know, enough is enough, he's doing some great work on that, and obviously RMT, RMT in my opinion is, you know, replace the, the, the uh, National Union of Mine Workers as the Brigade of God, if we can use a militaristic sort of analogy, mm -hmm. of the Labour movement, they really are, and, uh, and it's great to see this, Support that they are getting from the uh, wider general public. So there's room for hope, isn't there? I mean, it's great. You know, trade unions seem to be backing down again. When people are beginning to, you know, to wake up to the to the reality of this kind of neoliberal nightmare that we've been living through for the last forty odd years. Inequality has, is, is growing, you know. Inequality got considerably worse under, under New Labour. But I think that the trade unions have an important part to play here, and enough is enough does as well. Um, and it's about political education, you know, and we need to be investing in that. We need to be raising people's political consciousness to recognise that they don't have to accept. I mean, Jeremy talked about this, you know, we just don't have to accept this shit that we, that we just handed. We don't have to. We're the fifth biggest economy in the world. If we wanted to, we could eradicate poverty. Local authorities, here's a bit of political education. Local authorities in this country today, with the powers that they have at their disposal, could eradicate the housing crisis. They could do it. They could do it very quickly as well. Because there's no cap on the housing revenue account now. There hasn't been for some years now. Ironically, this has been made possible by the Tories. But they're not doing it. So they could be building houses, creating jobs for people. But they could also be acquiring properties. When I used to be a bricklayer, I used to work for the local authority, and there was a municipalisation programme. We used to buy properties all over the place. So that's what really they could be doing. But I also think it's important, you know, this kind of old Tina, but there is no alternative, and this notion that somehow the, you know, the economy runs like the household budget. Utter nonsense. And my comrade here, as well as being my publisher, has written, we may have written other books, but now he's written a, uh, a book which is about to be published about fiat socialism and about essentially how we can use the flexibilities available to a currency issuing country like Britain is to actually you know, make substantial changes and you know, money literally is no object. Anything that's absurd in the past early 
can be afforded, can be paid for by the, by the, by the government. You know, tax doesn't fund our public services. Although lots of people who are, you know, I'm sure in, in office in North, and, and certainly John McDonnell fell into this trap, you know, was talking about, I remember him making a joke about the Tory manifesto. But the thing about the Tory manifesto, the only, the only numbers in the Tory manifesto is on the page numbers. Great soundbite, but it kind of fed into this notion that somehow we need billionaires, you know, to, uh, we need to please the billionaires to, to, to actually, you know, pay for a good society. And when I remember saying, I think I put this in the book as well, um, Lord Sugar said that he would leave the country if Jeremy Corbyn was uh, uh, elected to uh, as, as Prime Minister. I put out a statement saying, I'm delighted to drive Lord Sugar to the airport. Because we don't bloody need billionaires. You know, within, within our own uh, grasp, as it were, and uh, you know, all this talk about government borrowing is a misnomer. You know, the vast majority is one arm of the government if you aren't borrowing. It's like taking money out of this pocket, got some money, here's my wallet, all right? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lend this money from my left pocket to my right hand pocket. Oh shit, I owe all this money to my left pocket. In reality, I owe it to myself. It's nonsense. You know, we've got to get that message out. But, but Carlos is right, he's written, it's not out yet, make sure you get it when, he, when it comes out. And he's very kindly, and I'm very proud he's asked me to write forward uh, to it. So I think that's the sort of thing, that's the sort of ammunition that we need to arm people with. So that they can, when politicians give us the kind of bullshit, well, we can't afford it, we can't do it, can't do this, can't do that, you know, we can't address it, like local authorities, oh, we've had all these cuts from central government. Yes, they have, but there's things they could do. They could solve the housing crisis out. They could have a redistributive council tax right now, again, made possible by the Tories. You could ask the millionaires, the, built, the, you know, the wealthy people in the borough, to pay a considerable amount more. You could freeze or even reduce the council tax for the vast majority. You'd have to go to a referendum. But that's a way, I think, of engaging in local politics and saying to people, okay, what we want to do, we want to ask the rich people to pay a lot more. What do you reckon to that, eh? And where do you want to see, we're going to stop the cuts and we want to, we're going to invest in public services in our, in our borough, which has been under incredible stress for a long, long time. Not an ideal solution, but because of the cuts, this is what we want to do. So we can ask rich people to, 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 you know, to bear the burden a lot more. And anybody who lives in a big house, who's cash, who's asset rich but cash poor, will have a much more generous council tax support scheme. So nobody's going to kind of lose out as a result of that. I, got, I had to resign, I have to, but I did resign from the from bench because I was arguing for that point and I've been arguing it for six months. Again, I touched on this in the book actually, and then, then they kicked off on the Labour front bench and the Labour government front bench and people like West Street are saying, we will never increase council tax, never double council tax. I know, it could be even more than double it for, for the rich people, but you'd have to get buy-in from the local community to actually make that happen. And, you know, you could, as I say, engage in a debate with local people about, look, where, do you think, where should we invest this section? Should we be in social care and, 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 and better leisure facilities and stuff for the kids? Do you know what I mean? There's lots of things. Things can be done right now. And this is one of the things I think enough is enough ought to be looking at, as well as looking at the national sphere. Well, let's look at what powers are available now, where Labour's in control, say, if it lets, you know, stop putting pressure on these councils to say, look, don't give us this excuse that you can't do anything. You can solve the housing crisis in our borough. Why are you doing it? Do it now. You know, and then if you won't do it, then put people up that will. But the key thing is, I think, is political education. Mm. We've got to give people, you know, knowledge is power, isn't it? And as I say, I think, I think Carlos's book is going to be crucial uh, to that. Another couple of good books on that front is uh, The Deficit Myth by uh, Stephanie Kelton, yeah. you've obviously read it there, and, um, and The Reclaiming the State by Bill Mitchell, to do all those really important books. Uh, I don't know, whatever, uh, first and then... I hate to say this because I, I still do retain a certain high regard for Jeremy Corbyn, but I think that Martin Niemoller's um, adage has a sort of tragic uh, resonance here because, you know, first they came for people like Mark Wadsworth and Jackie Walker and, and Chris, obviously, and then they came for him in the end. Yeah. And there was no one left. Well, ironically, on the day that Jeremy was suspended, Obviously, the EHRC wanted to name me, I don't know if you know that. But uh, they wanted to name me, they said that I was guilty of, um, of, of harassing the Jewish community. A terrible calumny, you know. And all of the evidence they used was the bullshit evidence that, that you know, the Labour Party had used as a pretext to, to kick me out. And most of the examples that were used against me was because I was defending Jewish people who'd been, you know, all fairly attacked. I mean, you couldn't make it up, it's absurd. But to uh, Amar, we, so we were working, so we were doing a lot of media at the time, and, and Amar, who works in my team, and he does some amazing, was a great lad, Amar Kasmi, um, and uh, he dug out a speech that I made 
on the Democracy Roadshow, which somebody had recorded and put on the internet, put on YouTube or something, where I was making exactly that point. I mean, look, it ain't rocket science, is it? It was pretty obvious what they were going to do. But I was saying it explicitly, you know, they've got the Ken Livingston, they've got Ken Livingston, but they're never satisfied. So they went for more, they went for Jackie Walker, you know, they got Jackie Walker, and then they went for the next one, you know, they went all to it, blah, 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 you know. And, and I was saying, they haven't got me at that time, but they're after me. But ultimately, I was saying, they want to topple Jeremy Corbyn because they want to destroy this socialist anti imperialist project. That's why I've got to stand firm. That's why I've got to push back, I was saying, you know. That was about two and a half years before. But unfortunately, nobody listened. Well, nobody in the right places. Well, lots of people did listen. The Dutch Roots, I think, were on board. Much of the Dutch Roots were on board. But the, you know, but the powers that be, and the, you know, the rich kids that were advising Jeremy in the leader's office, you know, they, they have this, and again, I go into this in the book, mentality that we were a government in waiting. That's what they said. And they were forever, I was forever getting calls from Lotto, leader's office, uh, saying, um, don't go on this program. Well, why have you said that? And I remember going on to Newsnight, because uh, Emily Thornberry's team had put this appalling statement out about what was happening in Venezuela. This is when there was a lot of violence on the streets, fomented by the United States and fomented by the right-wing elites in, in Venezuela. Extreme violence being perpetrated, by, by the way. Um, anyway, they put this thing out, and it was all blaming it on Maduro, and blah, 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 you know, it was terrible. So Newsnight contacted me and asked me to go on, you see. And I was quite cross with it. So why are you asking me to go on? You're the state broadcaster. You know the context. You know what's happening in Venezuela. Why do you need me to go on? Like, you should be making these points. Anyway, in the end, I decided to go on. And, um, you know, made the point I was up against, what's his name, uh, Tom ha uh, Harris, right wing New Labour MP. He lost his seat in the in Scotland, Scottish MP. Anyway, we had this ding dong, and uh, the next day he had got, um, what's his name, David Prescott, who gets on the phone to me. Go, why do you go on there? What are you saying? Blah, blah, blah. I said, look, David, this is bloody ridiculous. You know, you're forever ringing this up. I've said nothing that Jeremy didn't say in both of his leadership campaigns. What's your problem? He said, ah, but well, that was a leadership campaign. And now we're a government in, government in waiting, so we have to be more circumspect. And I said, Jesus Christ, you, you're completely wrong. You're 180 degrees wrong, David. That's what, Ed Miliband, where he went wrong. If you start triangulating like that, yeah, you might win over a few Tories, but you're going to lose all these people that have been inspired by Jeremy Corbyn. We have to be even more of an insurgent party than we were previously if we're going to have any chance of winning the next general election. But that mentality was what held sway, and that's what, that's what killed us. Just a couple of points. Um, I think Chris is probably a great point. I think Chris's book is probably, uh, it's, a, it's a remarkable book. I think it's, uh, you know, Probably the most left wing book I've ever read by an ex Labour MP, actually. You know. well, thank you. Some of the issues it, uh, it takes up are quite astonishing. It's frankly to go beyond. I think, I, I think what, um, what Ken said is very appropriate that the Social Democrats will always betray the working class and be, betray, betray, our, you know, betray you know, what, this, what they, the theory is supposed to stand for. I think the problem is that much of the Labour left is not very clear on what that means, you know. And, uh, uh, so I think it's not just education, really. it's actually clarification as well, you know. I mean, in his book, Chris mentions a few things about the, you know, Philip, Stone, Philip Stone's remarks about, uh, about, about the world and the left and all this sort of thing. But he also quotes Lenin at one point about, yeah. the, uh, about the nature of the Labour Party, yeah. being led by reactionary. Yeah, the worst kind of reaction is about that. Yeah. And I think we, need, we do need to have a party. I think we do need a party. I think we need a party that can actually develop beyond the, uh, uh, this concept of, uh, of reformism and, uh, and the parliamentary modes of socialism and all that, and do that as a, in an educational and uh, political way. I think that's quite a difficult balance to strike, because we do want to build a mass organisation as well. Yeah. Um, the other point I'm making about Bill is about Zionism, mm -hmm. and I think that's actually quite a complex question, but it, you know, it, it, it's very confusing because you get all this stuff about so-called anti-Semitism. But I think that Chris is, uh, is right. This is not about anti-Semitism. It's not, a, it's not really about, about hostility to Jews at all. It's about, it's about imperialism, actually. You know, it, it is, Zionism is actually a part of imperialism. It's a key part of imperialism. It's not the same thing as it's imperialism in general, but it acts as a sort of like a... Uh, a ginger group within imperialism that strikes it, that, 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 that stiffens it up in many cases. You see this with the neocons in, in, in the United States that uh, uh, particularly pushed the, uh, the war against Iraq. You know, 
they were very much posting in the Zionism. And I think we need to have some sort of formulation that goes, that goes beyond this defensive stuff about you know, we're not anti-Semitic, we're anti-Zionist. And point out the role that these people play in imperialism, you know, the, the, the Zionist Jewish Neocon. Like they have a racist project of their own. It, it brings them into sort of playing less role of an ultra, ultra hawkish uh, uh, ginger group within imperialism. So I think we have to we have to discuss that as well, you know, because uh, we're going to get confronted with this again, to be honest. You know, they will have a go. They will look for ways to have a go at the new party. And we have to stiffen up and, and, and stand up to it. I completely agree, and I can't really add much more to what you said, but we absolutely have to stand up. We have to, I mean, as I kept saying, and I already mentioned this point, you know, look, Jeremy, you know, you've got nothing to apologize for. Stand up for your reputation until the campaign group. We need to stand up for our reputation. What are we doing allowing ourselves to be trashed like this, for God's sake? It's absurd. They don't work, apart from anything else. I mean, on the day that I was reinstated and there was effort, 100 MPs had signed a motion to have me, uh, have the whip withdrawn for a year and, uh, 50 odd members of the House of Lords have signed it as well. Uh, John McDonnell, again, I talk about this in the board, but he, he contacted me to say, What you need to do, this is four years in, by the way, of knowing that these tactics don't work, saying, What you need to do is apologise again and again. Go and see any MP or offer to meet any MP who's been hurt, distressed, or offended by what you've said. Do the same for any National Executive Committee who feels offended, distressed, or hurt by what you've said. Go and see the Board of Deputies, go and see the Jewish Leadership Council, basically you won't prostrate yourself before a bunch of right-wing anti, uh, uh, right -wing Zionists. Um, I said, look, Charlie, no way I'm doing that. It doesn't work apart from anything else. I mean, it would be a dishonorable thing to do anyway, but look, the light of experience, it's almost like, where have you been? Have you been in a coma for the last four years? <laughs> well, because we tried this tactic, it doesn't bloody work. So I said, look, what I need you to do, John, I've complied with every dom common of this Kafkaesque rule of the Labour Party, while my reputation has been dragged through the gutter, they've been called from a pig to a dog. Not a solitary soul in the campaign group has spoken up for me. So what I need you to do, now I've gone through the process, now I've been reinstated, I need you, John, to issue a statement today, welcoming my return to the party, looking, saying how much you're looking forward to working with me again, and go on the bloody leader and defend me. They don't do it. They don't do it. Anybody else? Or Thank you. Oh, yeah, please. Thank you. Very quickly, I just, John McDonald was a real disappointment. But I just wondered, do you, Jeremy Corbyn, ever accept any responsibility to your face? Did he say anything in terms of his own responsibility about the things? Sadly not, no. I mean, I don't entirely blame Jeremy, because I mean, Jeremy was in an incredibly difficult position, massive pressure on him, as we know. They set out on a course, and I think he found it difficult to, you know, to step off that treadmill in that sense. All of the pressure from the rich kids in the Labour's office was to do this, you know, to take that route, you know. It was, I mean, and somebody uh, told me that, uh, uh, and they didn't want to reveal, the they didn't want me to reveal who had told them, but it's a very senior figure in the Leader's office, right, who said to this other influential figure, uh, it, uh, they said, um, Chris Williamson's not the hill to die on. And his response was, well, what, what, what is the bloody hill then? You know, I mean, when, when, when are we going to stand and fight, as it were? But no, Jeremy, Jeremy hasn't. Um, and, uh, you know, I think in some ways, you know, it's going to be difficult. For, I mean, I've moved on, but I think just for us, unless there is a, a recognition, I think a lot of them still haven't recognised where they went wrong, you know. But until there is that recognition, that they screwed it up, but the back tactic was utterly bloody disastrous, it's got to be very difficult to move on. And you know, that's why I say about the left, which is, I mean, they, I mean, that's why they don't want this story to be told, you know, and obviously we're not getting any coverage in the mainstream media and the likes of the Guardian and all the rest of it, you know. Um, and so it's going to be up to us, isn't it, you know, to sort of, you know, spread that way. No, no, it, 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 it's, it's, not, it, it's sad, I mean, but you know, I'm not, I mean, I saw Jeremy came and spoke at an event um, in Derby, a uh, commemoration of uh, George Julian, Hardly a, a, a chartist who addressed 5,000 people on a place called, a place called Chester Green. Uh, and we were commemorating that and Jeremy was there, you know. You know and and you know, we had a very nice and agreeable uh, discussion, as it were. And, you know, I think the hope, anyway, that Jeremy will still have a, an important role to play going forward. 
Well, I think we've got to kind of move beyond because it went wrong, you know, and we need to acknowledge that. And I think we need to, you know, look to ourselves, look to ourselves, you know. I mean, look, Jeremy used to always make this point. Anyway, he didn't say it's not about me. I always used to get and say, I used to go around the country at the Democracy Roadshow, etc. Jeremy used to, I used to say, there are two banned words in Jeremy's vocabulary. It's I and me. He never talks about I and me. It's not the big I am, we do. It's always us and we. Yeah. And I think we've got to, you know, take that spirit forward, you know. Let's not be too hard on Jeremy because, as I said, you know, he rehabilitated uh, socialism. He inspired, you know, hundreds of thousands of people to join the party. He inspired millions of people, if we're honest about it. Um, yeah, it went wrong, but, you know, I think we need to take the good bits of, of, of that uh, and, um, and through, event, you know, organisations like Enough is Enough and trade unions and etc. Trade union and socialist coalition and socialist labour party, etc. We've got to embark on this process of political education, I think. And now that, again, don't just want to leave it to the leaders. That it's up to all of us, isn't it? You know, we've got to go out and proselytise, haven't we, to to the wider sort of movement and the wider general public. It seems to me, and that's the way we was prevailing. I think. Chris, can I just criticise you for calling Jeremy Corbyn a socialist? He's not. He wants to make capitalism work right. his way. He's so certainly not a socialist. Well, as, as Ken said, so, social democrats will always. Uh, I think there's a um, actually Chris's last comment sort of, of answered my question, which was, are you still optimistic? Because I think you know, there is optimism there. And actually, contrary to the you know, that um, colleague at the front who just said Jeremy's not a uh, socialist and made the point about parliamentary democracy, just as a, a simple aside, the Paris Commune, which is the first sign of working class in history, took power. It was actually through an elected, it was actually municipal council. But, you know, so um, you, you can combine parliaments, parties, and mass movements. I think Chris has explained that very well. I think I don't know if this is the you know, I can't be very strong about that. But I actually think there is optimism. I think we're seeing the disintegration of the Tory party yeah. playing out in front of our eyes. We're seeing the revival of trade unionism. Who would have thought um, six months ago when we were talking about is a, is a general strike possible in Britain today? And I tell you now, that is inherent in the situation. The, you know, the slight hiatus of you know, the death of the monarch is going to have you know, uh, 10 days effect, perhaps dampening the situation. But the cross of the crisis has not gone away. We are entering into a very, um, what's the word, uh, unstable or uh, um, explosive period in Britain. And I think we, we can be optimistic if we draw some of the lessons that Chris has uh, said. Find ways of working together. Chris mentioned you know, I'm from the get the climbing skirt from the trade unions and socialist coalition. We've been attempt, you know, attempting to try and you know, there is a coalition of equals. We need to plan, I think, for the general election. And we also need to have candidates and local elections coming up next May and so on. But basically, I would say, and I, you know, I'm answering the question but asking Chris as well, because I, I know Chris is optimistic. I've worked with him for the last 18 months. But are you optimistic? You know, you know, there is hope, isn't there? Really? there? Absolutely, I think there is hope. I mean, and yes, we've had a terrible blow. We've had a setback. Well, more than a setback. It was a terrible, catastrophic defeat, if we're honest. But we've been through that. I, I, I mean, and you know, let's hold on, as I was just saying there, to the fact that you know, so many people were inspired, and you know, socialism was rehabilitated. Trade unionism is you know, being kind of rehabilitated. I think there's been an 800% increase in the number of people searching the, um, the TUC uh, website uh, about you know, trade union and role of trade unions. There's lots of young people, you know, they don't even know what a trade union is, or didn't anyway, you know. And so, yeah, I think we have to be optimistic. And as socialists, we are optimists, aren't we, at the end of the day? I mean, and so we always have to, you know, keep hope alive. I mean, I always used to quote that great quote from the Shawshank Redemption, you know, hope is a good thing, maybe the best of things, and no good thing ever dies. So we need to hold that, I think, to our heart. And you know, go forward in confident that you know we can bring about the change and use this experience yeah. in a positive way so that we don't make those same mistakes again. All right. Well, thank, thank you very much. Loki, Loki over here, Kareem, my comrade, uh, has brought some. So if you want a copy, um, Kareem's got them and. Carlos is the man to pay. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. And also, thank you very much for the uh, personnel of uh, oh, yes, sorry, two, sorry. two uh, down north for making yes, this yes, possible. Thank you. Absolutely. Yes. Thank you very much.